<laughs> okay, gang, if you could please grab a seat. There'll be plenty of other time to continue your conversations over the next day and a half. We want to get rolling this morning to try to stay on schedule. Is, uh, is an interesting story. We had a professor friend who needed a place to do some research, and she asked if we had a field that we would, uh, you know, let her put some cover crops in and, and uh, so forth. And, and my dad had had some negative experiences with cover crops back in the 80s, and so we weren't terribly interested in cover crops, but we agreed to do it, uh, you know, for her, because she helped us on some other fronts. So um, we started to seed annual ryegrass, didn't really pay that close of attention until uh, it was the first week in April, and the ryegrass that year was probably eight inches tall, maybe a little bigger, and I was out fixing a tile hole, and I dug a hole down to, to get to the tile to fix the hole, and as I was down in the trench, uh, I could see roots down four feet deep, and that was kind of the aha moment. I know that if, if we add up the benefits, if we look at uh, where we've improved, uh, one of the first farms we bought, uh, we doubled the organic matter. We've gone from 2% to 4%. That that 2% organic matter gives us 60 more units of N a year. At current market rates of nitrogen values, that's uh, at 50 cents a unit, that's $30 an acre per year. That same 2% of organic matter is capable of holding about 16,000 gallons of water per percentage, so 32,000 gallons of water, and that's only in the top 12 inches. We hope we're creating this uh, phenomenon even deeper in the soil, but we're, all these numbers I'm talking about are just in the top 12 inches, uh, so they could be higher. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, that's equivalent to an inch and a quarter rainfall event that we get in August after it quits raining that our neighbor doesn't. Our cover crop uh, plan, uh, or, or the reason why we want to cover crop, is a long-term viewpoint that um, the sun is our free resource, and that any time we have sunshine, we want something green and growing and putting carbon into the soil, back into the soil, as we try to rebuild our organic matter back to what it once was. Um, if I can retire someday or, or look out across the farm and, and see that we've returned uh, soil organic matter to close to equilibrium for this area, I'll, I'll be thrilled to death. My name's Trey Hill, and I currently run Harborview Farms with my father. Uh, we're partners. We're on the eastern shore of Maryland. We're directly across the Chesapeake Bay from Baltimore City, and we till about 40 miles north of here to about 40 miles south. We're kind of typical farmers. Um, we're corn, wheat, soybeans. Um, we run Case and John Deere equipment. The wheat is winter wheat that we harvest in late June, and then we double crop soybeans in too. We're probably about the same uh, latitude as like a southern Indiana, um, northern Kentucky. Um, we kind of run in that track with the GDUs and stuff. We've been using cover crops for probably 20 years um, in varying degrees of implementation. Um, we started small with like the EQIP programs and doing like three or 400 acres a year, um, then killing them off. Um, and now uh, the last two to three years, we're probably 100% cover crop, you know, depending on what we can get done in the fall. Um, this year, we're definitely 100. Um, that was kind of my goal to achieve that. And um, for our experience, we typically use barley because it's the least expensive. It's a good cereal, it's a good scavenger. As the season progresses, as we get into later fall, uh, we switch to wheat. Um, we find that wheat does better when it's colder um, in terms of germination and growth. And then we're also experimenting with some cereal rye and some triticale, and then we're trying to figure out, uh, I guess our big transition the last three years is we used to always kill everything off in March. We have a state program that's similar to EQIP, and you have to terminate all your cover crops. So we always kind of race to get that done. 
Uh, now we've since switched gears um, due to a couple challenges we had where we didn't get field sprayed or we spread a headland and not the interior of the field. Um, we've now made it a goal to plant them green um, to where this year we're like 90% planted green. My big concern was if we got a really wet spring, what kind of mess would I have? And I'm fortunate that this year's been the wettest spring in the history of the state of Maryland. I think we've had rain like 19 out of 21 days for the month of May. We haven't done anything in May. So we planted everything in the last two weeks of April. Or actually I planted um, three fields March 27th. And then it got cold, frosty. Um, we planted it green, beautiful stand. Um, it's at five leaf, um, it looks great. It survived several frosts, two weeks of cold weather. It looks terrific and I attribute that to planting it green. The thing I was missing was when I was killing it off early, I always have struggled with getting my no-till to match my conventional ground. I come from a you know farm of plowing people. I mean, my father is, you know, you plowed until the field was perfect and you did everything right and that's the way you did it and that's the way you farm. And I believe that was the best, most responsible thing to do at the time. Um, now that we're doing this, I still couldn't ever quite get it to match up. Um, we'd still take our best fields and conventionally till them because we weren't getting the yields, and I think it was based on emergence. So now that I'm planting into a green, I'm getting much more even stands. My soil organic matter is growing. Um, I've got much better earthworms than I've ever had. Last year was the first year I've ever had my no-till beat my conventional in yields. Um, and we're much better conventional farmers than we are no-tillers. So he's actually become a believer in it, which he's always kind of my, my truth tester. I'm always looking, you know, people think I'm a little crazy just because we're planting into stuff that looks like this. And I know it's not conventional. I know it doesn't look right. It doesn't look correct. But I'm like, well, if I can get my father to run a planter and plant into, you know, headed out barley and be happy with the job the planter's doing, the way it plants, all the fundamentals of farming, and then he's happy when we're combining and the yields are better than where we conventionally tilled, I'm like, well, that's, you know, you know, wish I'd done it sooner. You know, my vision for the future is something that, that I take very seriously. And I really think that for as much urban sprawl as we're seeing, and if you look at the numbers about how many acres of, of land we're using, losing out of production every year, we have to get better at what we're doing. We have to preserve the soil and make it as rich and productive as we can. And the natural way is the obvious way. And it's through growing crops, growing cover crops, growing your own nutrients to put the organic matter back in the soil. It's the natural way. And I, I think if we do that, and we spread the news and get the message out and it catches on that we can be more productive in the U.S. than we've ever been since we broke out the land in the 1800s and 1900s. We're seeing in the past several years talking about green. Everybody wants to be green, environmentally friendly for the atmosphere. I think it's time that we look at the dirt and have a brown revolution to improve the soil instead of where it's at, get back to the dark, rich soil that we all used to have. Good morning, everyone. 
Thank you for answering. Uh, my name is Wayne Honeycutt, and I have the pleasure of serving as the president and CEO of the Soil Health Institute. It's a nonprofit out of Research Triangle Park, and our mission is to safeguard and enhance the vitality and productivity of soils for, through scientific research and advancement. When we say advancement, we're really talking about adoption. And I feel really excited today because I think we have three of the nation's premier farmers with us that have been on this journey for a while. And uh, I think there's a whole lot uh, that we can learn from them. So you, I'm sure you have just kind of a little teaser with the video there. But this panel this morning is really just kind of, you know, tease that out a little bit more, a little bit deeper depth. Hear from them a little bit really kind of about their journey. And so I have right here on my immediate left, uh, Dan DeSutter, farmer out of Indiana, Trey Hill, farmer in uh, Maryland, and Jimmy Edmonds down there. Jimmy is a farmer out of uh, Oklahoma. <laughs> And I appreciate the hat, <laughs> really do. Another thing I gotta tell you before we get going that I appreciate is that none of us wore white socks. Now let's see how tall these chairs are. Well, maybe. Oh, all right, you got him, you, you got him hidden. Yeah, you done, you, you done good, as they'd say where I'm from. Yeah. Um, so I also wanted to make sure everyone knows that there's some little index cards in the chairs near you. And uh, so uh, I'm going to ask a few questions, kind of dig a little bit here in, in their experiences. Uh, but, you know, we want you all to be able to ask questions, too. So if you could please write down any questions that you have. And then a little bit later on, in the next half hour or so, uh, we'll uh, tell you it's time to hold them up. And somebody will come by and, and pick them up. And then we'll try to cycle through some of your questions. That work for everybody here? Yes. Excellent, excellent. Well, one of the first things I wanted to kind of kick things off and talk to you all a little bit about is your journey. Because obviously you're farming a farm, have an operation right now that's different uh, than when you first started. And I just kind of think it would be helpful to understand what your farm was like, what your operation was like when you first started. And just kind of tell us a little bit about your journey and what it's like now, but then kind of, you know, some of the challenges you have. I recognize we got you know, all the way in the East Coast, where you get, what, 40-something inches of rain uh, there in Maryland, Indiana, but then all the way over in Oklahoma, you got, you got different issues. No rain at all, right? You, you, we got different issues and so different constraints with adopting some of these practices with cover crops and some of these other soil health practices. And so uh, we just kind of love to hear about your journey, uh, kind of how you started, what the farm was like when you, when you started farming, what it's like now, kind of how you came, overcame those barriers, what you ran into and how you overcame them. Dan, I'll pick on you first since you're closest by and, and the best dressed. <laughs> okay, well, I, I guess I have to give credit where credit's due and, and I had a leg up on my journey and my, my dad gets credit for taking the first step down the soil health path. Back in 1983, he transitioned our farm, which at the time was 700 acres, to Ridge Till. And he did that in a world where we didn't have a lot of the tools we have today and the challenges were numerous. And I watched uh, him struggle to make that work and, and, uh, and, and that's really all I knew because I was coming of age as he did this. So I've had the benefit of not being encumbered by you know, the, the full width tillage mindset. You know, I, I, I'd be a terrible tillage farmer. I don't know the first <laughs> thing about it. Um, so. Uh, that, that's where it started and uh, you know I went away to college uh, it was the 80s the farm didn't look too promising and and I, I went down some other paths and um, he had some health issues that brought me back and one of the first things that that we did jointly together uh, we went to Jim Kinsella's farm and I'm sure there's a lot of people here that that maybe uh, got to experience uh, Jim uh, back in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, and, and from that we decided to go to no-till, and we came back, and of course my dad was thinking we should phase in over three to five years, and I said, no, let's, let's, let's get rid of all that ridge-till stuff and get the stuff we really need to do no-till right, and we just did it all at once, and, and uh, you know, that's kind of a commitment we made, to, and really our, our practices have evolved in lockstep with our understanding. And you know, back then we were thinking physically. We were looking, at, 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 you know, Jim taught us to think like a root. 
And so we were thinking about physically, how do we open up the soil to get roots to go deeper to raise better crops? And, uh, you know, as, as we stumbled into cover crops like the video showed, um, you know, we started to look at different aspects uh, beyond the physical and, and, and really uh, the whole biological world started to open up. And, and our, our understanding of that is still very rudimentary, but, but I guess what I've come to believe today that uh, if you think of the soil or the systems that drive as a three-legged stool with the chemical, the physical, and the biological, I really think the biological trumps the other two. And that if you get the biology right, the other two will fall in line. If you, if you don't get the biology right, then nothing else works the way it could. And so today, you know, I think, uh, you know, the use of cover crops, uh, trying to inject more diversity, uh, bringing animals back onto the landscape, those are all attempts to really um, fast track the biological um, activity in the soil. Yeah. I really like that, the three-legged stool, because when we talk about soil health, we really emphasize that we've learned a lot and gone a long ways by focusing on the chemical and physical aspects, as you described, but it's that biological component that's really kind of that next frontier opportunity for us and holds so much promise. Do you mind if I use that? <laughs> I'm yeah. All right, thanks. Trey, could you give us kind of a little rundown on your operation and kind of where it was when you started? What issues you were overcoming to bring it where it is now? Yeah, I would say so. We, we were early adopters of no-till, um, but never 100%. We could never get, um, I'd say when I was in high school and then when uh, getting home from Purdue, had to throw that in there. Um, we, we, uh, we were doing about half no-till, half conventional. So anything that was hilly, anything that had, had slope, we would no-till. And that was because we could get better yields no-till than we could conventionally because they were usually our most drought-prone soils because the topsoil was already gone. But for all our good flat land, um, where we really wanted to push yields, we could always grow more with the plow. Um, if we plowed it, made it look nice, you got it nice and even, and we just could never quite bridge that gap. Um, so as we progressed, we started doing cover crops. Um, like I said in the video, they were, we were burning them off too early. And we couldn't figure out how to get that going. And then just through basically mistakes, missprays, everything else, we started planting green and um, yields started bumping up. So uh, we looked at it as a team um, where it's, you know, regardless of the operator, regardless of my father, myself, we've kind of all transitioned to this plant and green on our no-till ground. And we're still doing some conventional, but as the yields were starting to equal out, we realized we were spending way too much money, getting too much soil erosion and all those things. So even my father, who was, who was like I said, he's a, a diehard farmer. I mean, brilliant, built the company. We were always big, so we wanted to keep things simple. And then you get into no-till and you get into, then you start doing cover crops, planting them green, everything becomes much more complicated. So now we're utilizing technology and, and enterprise software and everything else so that we can start to track this, this stuff so that we can build complexity back into our system. So as we're doing that, we're starting to realize that the ecosystem, this ecological farming um, with technology is much more complicated. So we're better trying to mirror what the ecological system would do so in the planting green, we're thinking, well, Mother Nature never plants into a dead, clean field. Mother Nature plants into growing fields, whether it's the prairies or the forests. Everything's alive when it's planting. It's just all in cycles. So we're trying to try to better mirror that. And it's gotten to where now we're starting to figure the cover crops out. Um, and we're trying to get them more consistent. You know, originally when we started doing cover crops, we would kind of just throw them out there. This was a, a bonus thing, just, you know, spread it and go. Um, but now we're realizing our corn emergence wasn't even where the cover crops weren't even. So now we're treating the cover crop as a crop, trying to get it even so we can get back to almost a, a, a conventional style planting bed that happens to be, you know, waist tall and green and flowering. Um, so I'd say that's kind of how our, ours, you know, where dad used to call me because the field was clotty and we needed to run the disc over it again. Now he's calling me because the cover crop's not even enough. Yeah. Um, so it's been kind of neat. It's been a really fun transition for us yeah. um, as, we, as we've gone through it. Excellent, excellent. So, I've got to ask you the same question, Jimmy, if you could just kind of feel us in so we kind of get a lay for what you've been going through. Well, it, mine has been quite a, quite a journey. Uh, in, I farmed with, my first crop was at nine years old uh, with my dad and granddad, and we were heavy tillage. And so we were all three joined at the hip uh, throughout that uh, early career. And in 94, uh, we lost granddad in a wreck my dad had cancer and then we lost dad the following year. So it was a, a big transition period. We, Ginger and I had started no-till ourselves. Granddad and dad were not 
quite so willing to, to do that. And so there was a big transition period there. Uh, and we weren't very good at no-tilling uh, in the early days. I, I'm quite truthful about that, that we had a lot to learn and, and a lot of mistakes made. And so we were doing that on some small acres of our own. Now, mother is in charge, and, and we got to do it the way dad and granddad uh, had done, and that's, that's okay with me uh, because we, we need to work with mom and understand it and trying to push her along a little bit. Uh, and then in about 2009, uh, we knew financially that something had to change, that uh, inputs were going up, uh, costs were going up, revenues were going down, and we had to make a significant change. And uh, so we started in that, but as we started into that, here came the big drought. And, uh, you know, in 2011, uh, we had about nine inches of rain that year, and the following year we had less than that, around seven, something like that. Uh, so big challenges with cover crops that year. But what we started noticing, we had water probes in the ground, and, and the NRCS was really good with us in helping us pull cores. All at once, we started noticing that we may be using more water up front, uh, but we were a lot more efficient with our water, and our infiltration rates were better. So as the year went along, our water was better where we had cover crops, even in the drought. And so we knew we were on to something, and uh, we started planting more cover crops. We went from a, uh, a few acres to, to a lot of acres pretty quick. Uh, by then, uh, mother had turned everything over to us to operate, and she said, looks like you're, you're doing fine. And so now we're fully covered uh, year-round when we're harvesting. Uh, we're planting. We just finished planting as we're speaking right now. Uh, we're dry. Uh, it, some of that's not going to come up, uh, but we know that a, a root in the ground is more important than not. So we're, every time I don't plant, even though we're dry, uh, that's a mistake. We see that time and time again. So I never break the <coughs> rule anymore. I, I prefer to plant right behind the, the combine. Best rules don't always apply. We get busy and we can't get some of that done as quick as we'd like. Uh, but we know that that's the way to do it. And so we made a pretty good transition. We're trying to track that and, and much like uh, what we heard earlier, we can, we can see a darkening layer about an inch or a little better a year if we got cattle or animals implemented into the system. And uh, that's pretty exciting. Our, our activity below ground is getting much, much better. It's, uh, once we start putting cattle back in on our cover crops, uh, that rate of micro activity escalated, I would like to say. And uh, it's very important to see that and to understand that. And uh, so it's, it's been a, a very good journey uh, and we're still learning. A lot of people say, well, you're the expert. Well, I'm not the expert, I'm just the guy that's, that's trying something that the neighbors won't try yet. And uh, to, to really understand it, you, you've got to look at the soil and you've got to dig and, and, and use the technology that we had. Uh, I always like to say my dad and my granddad were great farmers. They took great pride in their work, and they never intended to degrade the system the way we have. But my granddad was always about uh, buying a new tractor or a new piece of equipment. He was very innovative in that. And so he always used the best technology that was available to him. So why not? use the best technology that we have, and, and that would be no-till and cover crop systems. And uh, I think if we do that and, and have that basic principle, then things will align. Good. <clears throat> While we got you warmed up, I want to follow up on, on the fact that you're, what, what is your annual precip where you are? Around 20 inches, around, give or take. Around 20 inches. I, I, I don't know what norm is anymore. Yeah, right. Do, do any of us, yeah. right? Yeah. It's, it's either sub or ab, yeah. And, and so, and you're in that situation, you know, we, we often hear that it's increasingly challenging for folks to adopt things like cover crops as you get into more semi-arid type of environment and totally understand that. 
and, uh, and uh, granola. There are those that say, well, you know, they could take up too much moisture, they would impact the falling crop, and those types of things. And I, I guess I'm wondering how you've addressed that challenge. Uh, do you perceive it's a real challenge or not for you and your operation in Oklahoma? And if so, how you kind of address it with, with your management of that cover crop and then in the following crop? Yeah, that, that's always a big question. You know, how do you do it in that, that environment? I said, well, we're blessed if you go west of us, they get half of what, what yeah. I get. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, yeah. we're dry, but it can be drier. Uh, the, the thing about water and plant and cover crops is you, you have to manage the system the way the system was designed. So I can't plant the amount of species that he can plant in a 40 inch rainfall. So I have to manage the population. I also have to manage the, the cover crop itself as in water use. So I don't want to use a lot of corn in my mix because it's high water use. So you've got to learn that the native prairie that we had was set up to survive in that environment. So you kind of need to look back and, and try to best we can emulate what was happening there. So we have to watch what we plant. We have to watch the population. A lot of people at home want to talk about pounds. Uh, and so our rule is if we get 20 inch rainfall, we should not plant more than 20 pounds of cover crop. But I'm more on population, so that should be around 450,000 seeds or something like that. You can kind of manipulate that as, as necessary. So you have to watch that balance. But once we done that, we saw that we, we were using water up front, like I said earlier, but as the rains do come, our infiltration rates are higher. And so we gain that back pretty quick. And then once we get into the growing season a little bit further, then we're water ahead in the end. But you've got to watch that trend all through the, the year to really understand that. So is it, is it fair for me to say, if you want to make it work, you can make it work? Yeah. In Oklahoma, we're pretty diverse. I've got some guys in eastern Oklahoma that I, that's in that rainfall area, similar to yours, that try to get rid of some water so they can plant. So we plant high populations to help them, which I have trouble doing that because it's like, <laughs> well, I can't believe you're trying to get rid of water. When I need every drop, I can. But yes, I've traveled from Montana uh, to North Carolina, and, and it works everywhere if you watch the system and try to watch where you were in the beginning and try to get that in where you're at today. Excellent. So one of the things that I picked up between what Trey was describing and what you were describing is that you're not just throwing cover crop seed out there and then waiting until the spring and come back for your main crop. You are managing that cover crop. It's, it's a full-time management time. job, and then trying to manage the rotation. So we're trying not to plant the same crop on the same acre, but every fourth year or fifth year. And we're in wheat country. I was born and raised a wheat farmer, which you either was planting wheat, grazing wheat, harvesting wheat, or plowing wheat ground. And, and our rotation was wheat. Now we had a little dab. Of, <laughs> we had a little dab of cotton, but we were were grown up in in wheat country. So now when I'm planting rye, that's not so popular in in, in wheat country. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Well, um, Trey, any any other aspects, kind of about the management of the cover crop? I know you were talking about kind of getting it established, but any other aspects of it that are kind of a what? you've been challenge with? I agree a lot with what Jimmy said on the water management. I found that a lot of the cover crop in the spring, now that we're planting everything green, is counterintuitive. Um, you would assume that if it's a dry spring, having that cover crop growing would dry the ground out more. And everyone around us, as soon as they call for like a 10-day dry spell, they go, get your cover crops killed as fast as you can. Well, I don't kill any of them. We just let them go. But we've actually found that the ground doesn't dry out any faster with stuff growing on it, which goes completely against anything I would think. Now, if it's extremely wet, it definitely pulls the, the moisture out. But what I consider it is that the cover crop is, is more of a natural system. So it tends to keep things at what I call equilibrium. It's probably not the right scientific term. But it kind of keeps everything at equilibrium. So as, if it's green, I can go out the same time guys are out plowing to dry the ground out. I'm planting. 
um, because the, the roots are there, and I'll use, uh, I think Keith Burns said this, the soil turns out like chocolate cake. It's kind of the best ex explanation of it. And it really is malleable, and you don't get the sidewall compaction, you don't get the smearing that you do in a straight no-till system because the planter is able to work better. Um, but all of that went counter to anything I thought would happen, much the same as, as no-till holding more water than conventional. Conventional to me, when you walk on it, is spongy, so it should hold more water, but that's, that's wrong. So kind of rethinking and, and um, kind of recalibrating my mind to understand that things aren't always what they appear has really made a big difference. Yeah. Now, Dan, did I read right that you are also now kind of incorporating more grazing in your systems? I know yep. Jimmy is. That's, uh, we're starting to work on that. We've had yeah. two generations of taking fences out, and we live in a part of the world where <laughs> if they do get out, they're going to go a long, long way because yeah. there's nothing to stop them. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we look at cattle as just another tool in the toolbox. Um, you know, they're our mobile mower uh, biological inoculators. And um, we're gonna use them to accelerate. Somebody said earlier that you can use animals to accelerate soil improvement. And we very much have seen that and believe that to be true. So it's just another tool in the toolbox to help us achieve our goals quicker. And you're giving me all kinds of one-liners. <laughs> the mobile mower biological inoculator, all right? Mikasa Sukasa. All right, all right. great. <laughs> That's, that's cool. Now, I guess I would wanted to hear from each of you, too, if you could describe some of the kind of the benefits that you're seeing. Uh, I, th I know I heard a little bit of resiliency to, to drought and stuff like that in there. I just I would love to hear what your impressions are. What what are your, you know, you don't have to open up, obviously, your, your bank accounts and show us what's in the, but, but you're all successful farmers, so I would have to think it's penciling out for you. And, uh, but I wanted to see kind of what other benefits that you feel like that you're you know, kind of accruing in your, in your farm and what's really gonna kind of contribute to the, the, the long longevity of it. Dan, start first. Yeah, uh, so as it's been alluded to, what we're really talking about here is trying to farm more in nature's image. Mm -hmm. And that the, the further down that path we go, the better job we do of mimicking nature you know, we start to need less inputs. You know, we see fewer weeds. We're mineralizing more fertility naturally, so we've got to buy less. We're making less trips over the ground. Um, we don't need all the Band-Aids, uh, so we're, we're saving a lot of money. And then, you know, uh, the question then becomes, how, how, do we, how do we monetize soil health on the output side? And uh, so far, we've been able to do that by raising non-GMO grains. The demand for non-GMO is exploding. And uh, so we're, we're getting more revenue that way, in addition to the seed savings, not having to buy all the traits to, to cover up for our poor agronomic practices. Um, and, and, and I think the future, uh, you know, today, uh, I heard a great presentation this summer that we have nanotechnology today that they can take a sensor the size of a small grain of sand and put it in your bloodstream. It'll monitor your blood chemistry and it will call your cell phone and text you and let you know that, hey, Wayne, you're gonna have a heart attack in 30 minutes. You better get to the emergency room. So what we know about soil health and soil health degradation is that our nutrient density and our food supply has, has decreased as soil health has decreased over the last 50 years. Uh, we're that close to having technology that will help us measure that nutrient density quickly, efficiently, timely. And I think that the future is that people are going to be willing to pay for that. And you can't, uh, unlike a lot of certification systems, you can't cheat this system. The only way you get that nutrient density is to have biologically active, healthy, functioning soils. And so... I, I think the future is very bright. If, if you build it, they will come sort of thing. If we, if we get our soils functioning properly, there are going to be economic opportunities to profit from that. I have to think that there needs to be some more research to verify a lot of that. That's actually one of our goals, one of our priorities in the Institute. But it just makes sense that if you are building up soil organic matter so you can get greater proliferation of roots in the system than those roots, and you get are more capable of taking up the nutrients in the water, 
and that greater biological activity is going to cycle more nutrients too. It's, so yeah. it just makes sense you could get more nutrient dense food. A, a lot of the science is already there. I mean, the, yeah. these nutrient density measurements have taken place over time. I mean, it goes back to Sir Albert Howard. I mean, that was his observation, healthy soil, healthy plant, healthy animal, healthy people. And maybe he didn't have the, the science that we'd like to see to back that up, but he had years and years of anecdotal <coughs> observations to back it up. And, and as farmers, you know, uh, if you want to be out on the edge, you can't always wait for the scientists to catch up. That's right. You know? That's right. We, we operate a lot on intuition and observation, right. and uh, it's great to have science to confirm that, but uh, can't let it slow us down. Yeah. Am I turning red yet? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I will admit that I used to try to farm, and I wasn't very good at it, so I became a scientist. <laughs> yeah. So, so Trey, Trey, I, I want to kind of, you know, Dan related uh, somewhat to the ecological aspects, the environmental aspects uh, of, of some of it too. And, and I know that, you know, I, I don't envy you for farming in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, which is probably a lot like farming under a microscope, I would have to think. And, and I would love to hear, you know, kind of your experiences in there because you're successful at doing that. And, uh, you know, just kind of seeing you know what you know how, how you were managing that situation too because that's that's something I know increasingly across the US farmers are more and more needing to, to work with um, well it's a, it's a, it'd be a very long story but um, when I was a kid we didn't like the environmentalists and the environmentalists didn't like us I think the big disconnect was that the environmental community didn't realize that when you tell a farmer he's not doing a good job you're not insulting his job you're insulting his family so farmers then become defensive they lash out, we go into this independent thing where we're growing food, you know, we're doing what needs to be done for the world, and we're not going to listen to you because people were fighting. And it was because people weren't handling each other right. We weren't communicating well. Um, so about 20 years ago, um, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, we had a big tisteria of fish kill in the, in the bay. Um, it was around 90, I think 98 or 99. And the environmental groups and the farmers decided that they needed to work together. So we had the, the board of the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, which is our strongest environmental lobby in Maryland, um, come out to the farm and tour the farm and talk to us. It was primarily my father at that point. Um, and we kind of realized that we were all on the same page. We all wanted cleaner water. We all wanted a better environment. We all have children. We all have children growing up in the same environment. And that was kind of the, the beginning of it. And I would say it's probably been 20 or 25 years since then. Um, now it's grown to where, in our little geography, um, we work with the environmental community. So I would say you should envy me because it's forced us to become better farmers. Um, we've been forced socially to perform to society, which I think is what everyone needs to adopt because that's what we need to do in order to make the world better. Um, so now we work each river um, that we farm on, we farm on four rivers, each one has a different river keeper. An organization that's a publicly run organization of which a lot of my landowners are parts of. Um, of which I'm, I'm one of the board members. Um, the president of the board is a farmer as well. And what we're doing is trying to come up with solutions, um, trying to figure out how can we do better variable rate nitrogen? Can they get us some grant funding for that? And it's, it's something that if you had told me this 25 years ago, I would have thought you were crazy that I would be an environmentalist and I'd be sitting on the board of an environmental group and helping form the groups and then also being head of the Ag Committee where we're saying, how can we help all farmers? Um, you know, do we, what, what can we do to, to make things better for the farmers so that they still make money? That's one of the main objectives. And, also, and stay in business, be sustainable. So now that we're, we're doing the cover crops, we're seeing them, when we were just no-till, doing waterways, we were all doing our soil conservation stuff, the bay kept getting dirtier. Or it was at least, it, it maintained itself. And it was very depressing for everybody because we were doing all this work, putting in waterways, ponds, no-till, nothing was changing. Um, we start growing cover crops and not everyone's planting green, I'm still a little bit of an anomaly there. The bay's getting cleaner. Um, so the water coming off our fields is cleaner. Uh, we're now inviting scientists in, which we never would have before, to put lysimeters in the ground and measure what's the difference in nitrate leaching into the groundwater where we have cover crops where we don't. Whereas before, we'd always been scared of the answer. You know, we didn't want the answer. The environmentalists didn't want the answer because we all based our livelihoods on the fact that we either didn't pollute or did pollute. So getting our heads wrapped around the farmer being able to admit that we do pollute or the reality, not admission, um, but just standing behind science that in order to grow corn, we're going to have some nitrogen breaks and some phosphorus breaks. How do we minimize that and mitigate it is different than, you know, having the environmental group say, you can't have any. We're saying, no, well, there's going to be some. It's a natural ecosystem. The forest has breaks. The, the prairie has breaks. You know, there's always going to be some, but how do we get, get it better? And um, 
So I'd say it's an enviable place to be in. The regulations haven't been bad. Um, we fought them all tooth and nail. Um, we don't want our nutrient records public, um, which is kind of our big fight now. Um, but we're still allowed to put on um, a sound amount of nitrogen, a sound amount of phosphorus and potash. Is we can put on what we want. So we're able to make a living. Um, my objective is to stay ahead of the rules. So for as long as I've adopted practices on my farm that will be you know, a year or two ahead of the rules, then the adoption really isn't that big of an issue. The guys that are still fighting the environmentalists and still think it's bad, I have a feeling they'll probably get weeded out, and those are the ones that you probably wouldn't want to envy. But um, all in all, I don't view it as a, as a negative, but more as uh, maybe neutral. <laughs> it's a lot of work, yeah. um, and there's some headaches, and it's a lot of social time and meeting time and things like that. I hang out at more environmental meetings than farmer meetings now. And so have these soil health promoting types of practices helped you address those environmental concerns there? I think they have, yeah, and I think the collaboration's been neat because you're meeting different people, and Dan and I were discussing before this that it's always exciting to have someone outside of agriculture come into agriculture. Dan thinks that one of his advantages is that he took time off in between school and farming, I think is what he said. Yeah. So I think that having these environmental folks, you know, if the, if the problem's on the table and they're looking at it on that side and we're looking at it on this side, we're looking at each other, but it's a matter of figuring out how do we, how do we come to a solution. And I think that a lot of what they've done, the reason we have a cover crop program in Maryland that's funded is not because the farmers asked for it, it's because the environmental community asked for it, but had me standing next to them and another farmer on the other side and all of us saying, hey, we're here together. We're here at state legislature. We need funding for these programs so that we can get cover crops initiated so that the bay will get cleaner. And now we're going to them and saying, hey, let's keep the funding source there because the bay is cleaner. You know, this is what we wanted. You know, we need to counterbalance the influx of people that are constantly entering the, the, the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So it's been, it's, um, it's, it hasn't been bad. Good. Um, before I get going on questions, are there any more questions that need to start filtering their way up through me, to me? you all could maybe round them to Rob. <clears throat> we'll put the Rob Myers view on them. <laughs> oh. oh, okay, great. Oh, I asked for a question, not a dictionary. <laughs> oh. Oh. All right, we'll get, we'll get to it. Um, <clears throat> while I'm deciphering this, uh, if maybe Dan, if you, know, you had an experience that I suspect you're the only one in this room who had that experience. Uh, as an Eisenhower fellow in 2015, traveling around New Zealand and, and observing what those farmers and ranchers are doing there. And, and uh, I, I just have to think we would all benefit if you could just kind of give us some of the highlights of, of what you learned, what you, what you observed and, and what you brought back and you know, maybe how you might have you know, inserted some of that knowledge in, into what you do to make your farm successful. Sure, um, well, the, the first thing I looked at when I started the fellowship was where can I go to experience a year-round summer? And so that's why I chose. <laughs> um, you know, I had a son that went to college in Canada. He said because they had this great program there, but I knew it's because the drinking age was 18. So uh, <laughs> I, I Just understand. For everybody's information, it's summertime in New Zealand, Australia in January and February. Uh, no, the, the purpose of the, the proposal for the fellowship was to study the, the social, cultural, and economic factors that lead people to adopt good soil health practices. And, and, and the reason why I thought New Zealand and Australia would be interesting is that back in the late 80s, uh, they eliminated all agricultural subsidies in both countries, cold turkey. And from an American perspective, that can be a little frightening, but I, I wanted to see what impact that had on how they farmed. And so you know, I spent almost three months traveling around and, and most of that time out on farms, uh, meeting farmers and talking to them about their practices and how they change. And, and a few striking things. One, uh, on the farms I was on, 80% of them grow at least five different crops. And, and that's born out of the reality that they can't afford to put all their eggs in one basket. There's gonna be no safety net there to pick them up and help them along if, if they raise all corn and it all gets hailed or droughted out and it fails. So they have winter crops, summer crops, legumes, grasses, they've got all these different mixtures and that's, that's one form of risk management that they employ in a, in a world where they don't have someone else uh, paying the tab when they fail. Um, also, 80% of those farms have livestock on them. 
And even though I found very few farms that were 100% no-till, they all recognized that they didn't want to disturb the soil anymore and they had to, but um, they compensated for that through the diversity, longer rotations, and then having time under hoof that they knew they could repair that damage. And overall, they had a much healthier, more resilient system. You know, they're forced to compete on, on a global stage, so they can compete with anybody in the world. I mean, they're primarily export-oriented agriculture. And so I guess the, the one thing that I'd want to bring home, and, 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 and you know, uh, we have a need in this country to move past our old-style thinking on, on uh, ag policy. You know, as everybody in this room is here today because they want to move agriculture forward down a more positive soil health path. And what you have to understand is that farmers are not driven by science and knowledge, we're driven by economics. And that the current way we subsidize crop insurance uh, distorts that message and is, in fact, the biggest impediment we face to changing. Until we change that, the needle's not going to move very far. And, and I know that's a scary prospect, and, and, and all these farms I was on, I asked every farmer the same question. Would you, if you had the opportunity, like to go back to a subsidized agriculture? And, and there was not one person that wanted it. They were all thought they were better off today than they had been under the old system. So I guess the message to the American farmer is that, uh, you know, we'd be, we'd be healthier and stronger without all that, and don't be afraid. Thanks, thanks. I know, Trey, you just returned from Europe, didn't you? you were, yes. You were touring some farms over there. Mm -hmm. any, any of those experiences you kind of feel like you're going to bring back I, your operation? They weren't big on no-till. Um, everything was plowed. <laughs> um, so soil health was a little different there. Um, they, I, but I felt like they had, um, you know, I'm trying to kind of rebrand now, and I think ecological was a good word that they used a lot more than probably I had in the past. And that's encompassing the animals. Um, so in where we are in Maryland, there's a lot of hunting, so we always have had wildlife habitat. You know, we always have deer habitat, uh, migratory bird habitat, duck habitat. Um, now we're starting to incorporate bees into it and try to figure out how we can feed the bees with the cover crops. So I think building a better system around it is good. Um, the one farmer I talked to was thinking about planting green. I was showing him pictures, and we were all excited. And then he said, how do you kill it? And I said, well, we use paraquat or glyphosate. And he said, well, we can use glyphosate for another two years. He's like, because it kills earthworms. And I was like, well, you need to prove to them that there's a lot more earthworms in a no-till field that's been sprayed with glyphosate than a field that's been mold or plowed. Um, so they're kind of, the, the conversations were very similar to what we have here, the food movement, um, how to adapt and adopt, and uh, those sorts of things. Excellent. So one of the uh, questions that came in uh, from the audience here, and I, I'll throw this back to you, Trey, is, uh, it's kind of a definition of planting green. I, I think we use that term and want to make sure everybody's on common level of understanding here. Um, the field is completely green when you plant it. Um, the cover crop's still standing, whether it's this big in March or up to your chest um, in late May, depending on when we plant and whether it's rye, barley, or wheat. But the field is completely green. Um, if it's over 12 inches tall in corn, we crimp it just to get it sunk down so we don't get shading. And we usually spray post. Um, so we'll plant and then spray, and that way we can make sure that we, we don't move the, the um, soil and stuff with the trash whippers, of, you know, so that the chemicals don't get moved, similar to what we used to do in conventional. Um, so that's what green would be. So the roots are still living. Um, nothing's been, well, sometimes we spray to kill the broad leaves and leave the cereals, and sometimes we do the opposite depending on the technique as we try to get things a little more complicated, but um, that would be the definition of planting green. And so what is kind of the benefit that you see for me, it came from an agronomic perspective. I kind of came at it from a different angle, I think, than most folks that are planting green. For us, it, it comes from the fact that it just plants better. Um, the soil's malleable. Um, so in no-till, if it's wet, you can't plant. Um, I'm very type A. My father's type A, so if it's, if we want to be planting. Um, so if it's green, it works much better. Um, as you open up the sidewall, you don't get near the compaction uh, from the disc openers. As you go to close the trench, you don't need near as much pressure. Um, so you can open it, close the trench, and higher levels of moisture in the soil so that you can get out there earlier um, and also plant wetter without getting the same compaction. Yeah. Okay. Good, good. So it sounds like you're still accommodating kind of the, the needs of, of that, that cover crop, uh, or the main crop in this case, and you're just kind of uh, still accommodating its needs for sunlight and everything. Mm -hmm. That's how you're still managing that residue. Right. Yeah, I'd add that, you know, in addition to using that plant, 
to solve a problem, which in our case in the springtime is getting soil moisture to where we can plant. You know, it's a different situation than Jimmy. I mean, we usually are too wet. We're waiting on it to dry out the plant. We can use the plant to help do that. The minute you kill the plant, it becomes a detriment. It makes it harder to dry it out. So we're using that gravity in our favor. The other thing is we're, we're creating more seamless environment for our microbes. You know, we've got the living root there right up until we've started the next thing. And, and so there's, uh, there's no lost food source from yeah. the microbial point of view. Yeah. And we've been playing with different chemical programs. We find that if it's early and we're trying to protect the crop from frost, like we're planting earlier than we should be planting corn, or by conventional wisdom, um, we'll let it grow. So like certain chemicals antagonize others, but they're still effective. So we'll mix, you know, atrazine with glyphosate. It makes the glyphosate take 20 more days to kill it, but you're actually getting a green root still in the ground as that plant's struggling to die, um, as the corn plant will be, you know, three or four inches tall before the cover crop's actually dead. So there's some, Things where we're trying to get this 365 day a year greenness or roots growing at least, um, but trying to do it through you know some kind of unconventional ways. I love that struggling to die. <laughs> yeah, Jimmy, you got some thoughts on that? Yeah, one of the things that and I want to talk a little bit about is crop insurance and and planting green in Oklahoma. We're if you're going to insure that crop, you're not going to be allowed to plant green. So you're going to have to have a, a bigger window, at least a two-week window or more to do that. So I've chosen not to insure to get around that uh, for my summer crops. Now, I'll still insure a little bit of, of winter wheat once in a while with landlords and stuff. But uh, So that, I planted green, but for most producers in that, in that area, especially if the bank's requiring uh, crop insurance, that's not going to be an option. And so it's 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 not always the same cookie across the, the country uh, as other places. So is it safe to say that some of these are biological issues, management issues, but then some of them perhaps are policy issues? I am a and uh, so we've got to keep the eye on the ball of all of them, I'm sure. That's right. Ayn, Ayn Rand would be proud, Jimmy. <laughs> uh, so another question that someone uh, sent in was uh, they would like to hear a little bit more about how you integrate uh, livestock cover crops. Jimmy? Well, for us, it was a, it's a natural because we're cattlemen uh, by nature anyhow. We actually have more acres of ranch land than we do of, of farmland. So uh, for our summer covers, it was the perfect fit because in July and August, that's when our grass is really starting to dry down and the, the performance, it's getting worse. So we have a great opportunity with our summer forages to to capture some of that and it's a good way to to generate some revenue and some beef back and give our native range a uh, a break when it really needs it uh, so it it can be ready for winter uh, to do that uh, we, we've done several things we run cow and calves uh, on the cover crops uh, through the summer to help our calves grow we, we've seen calves that's gained over three pounds 3.8 pounds a day uh, running on cover crops with their mothers. We've seen a lot of two to three pound uh, with yearlings. Uh, in that time period that, Wayne, we could have 100 degrees to 110 degree weather. Uh, but if we got that cover crop that's as tall as my hat or taller, uh, then that, that soil temperature is relatively low, uh, at least 20 to 25 degrees cooler uh, in the canopy than it would be in the bare soil and sometimes 30 degrees. So that's a great opportunity for us to get them cattle in there. And uh, they really help the biology. Uh, once we implemented cattle back into the, and I say cattle just because I'm a cattleman, but all animals where it be like Gabe, uh, where it's chickens, turkeys, pigs, all animals would be good for the diversity. But it really helps the biology. Uh, and the underground world web that, that very few farmers and ranchers really understand, uh, it really comes alive. And once again, when we start seeing that, then we can get away. We're all non-GMO crops now. Uh, we've reduced our inputs by 40 to 50% on chemicals and fertilizer. Uh, that's just a start. I think that'll get, get better as we go. 
remember that I start in a three tenths to four tenths organic matter. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I didn't I, know you could detect it that low. <laughs> Sorry, but go ahead. Yeah. You know, the, the gas gauge is past red yeah, yeah. Uh, and flashing. And, and so some of that soil now, we're, we're at two, one and a half to two. Wow. And we've got a few fields where we're approaching that three. We, we can't get over that quite yet because our sun is a lot more intense than, than up north. And so we, we burn up a lot more uh, just growing. And so it's, it's an ongoing challenge. But once we saw that turn around and start growing that organic matter back, then that's when we saw that we could do away with higher inputs, GMO crops in spring. We, our grain sorghum the last two years, we've had no uh, weed control chemically. We've used rye, and uh, so we, we've lowered that input out. We've also been able to not spray any pest because we put in pollinator strips. We're in a good study with Dr. Jonathan Lundgren uh, this year. Uh, on that where we're sweet netting them pollinator strips to see what we're attracting, see what we can help with that biology. So all that system approach, if we can get to that point, that's when everything, as we would say in Oklahoma, get, gets really clicking. It really starts jiving, the, 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 the mother nature syndrome kicks in and it's unbelievable what we can do. <coughs> Great. You know, it's interesting you're, you're talking about uh, the influence of temperature. And of course, hotter it is, more evaporative loss of the moisture. So now you're just going back into the atmosphere. But Dan, I've also heard you talk about just kind of the influence of that temperature on that microbial activity in soil. You know, tell us a little about what you've learned there. Well, microbes uh, are the underground livestock. They're not a lot different from above ground livestock, or for that matter, us. And, for microbes, 70 degrees is kind of the agreed upon optimum to achieve maximum microbial activity. And every 10 degrees, you go above it or below it, they say you lose half your efficiency or half your work. So um, contrast a soil uh, that's covered versus uncovered in the summertime in July when a corn plant's trying to fill or a wheat plant is trying to fill ahead, um, you know, you've got uh, a bare soil that's 100 to 110 up to 120 degrees, you've effectively ceased all microbial activity and therefore the, the ability of the soil to transform nutrients and feed that plant. And in and a, and a soil where you can maintain armor over the soil and keep that temperature down even in the 80s is a huge difference in your ability to continue to cycle nutrients and to provide the plant with everything it needs to stay healthy and to continue to, to achieve maximum yield. Yeah. Good. I think Dan brings out a good point. It, you got to think about biology is life. How many of you would want to work in a 120 degree atmosphere? 70 degrees? I can kind of get down <laughs> with that. Uh, so, they're no different than we are. Uh, w when it's 100 degrees, we're trying to get under the shade and work on a piece of equipment. Same way with the biology. Uh, so we have to think of the biology below ground just like us. It's all living, and you're going to fry it if you keep it bare. And they're not going to work, and they're, and they're working actually for free for us. And, and <laughs> So we just got to provide the atmosphere, and you got to think, just like that, that you wouldn't work in that atmosphere. Why would we expect them to work? Good. We have a little bit more time. I'm sorry that we do, because that's such a great ending comment. <laughs> uh, no, I, I do want to tease this out a little bit more. That one of the questions that they're asked that every every one of you all could address this, um, and this, you know, these are changes of systems, changing biology. And so you know that it can take some time for all the different components of those systems to kind of get in equilibrium with one another. And, and so we recognize that there's a change occurring. And I guess that was really kind of the nature of my question. If, if you want it to work, maybe you can. If you're just determined that it's not going to work, well, then you're right. It's not going to. Um, 
And I think there's kind of plenty of evidence here uh, of that, of what three gentlemen that really want to make it work uh, are making it work. Uh, but this is kind of a question of some of those challenges that they're wondering with your experiences. Are you uh, finding any additional problems with slugs or mollusks that are, you know, eating your seed or, or newly emerged cash crops uh, since you've been uh, adopting cover crops and, or no-till? Dan? Yeah, so... Um we had, in all our years of no-till, and even as we first started a cover crop, we didn't have much slug issue uh, to deal with. But um, along about that time, uh, it was decided uh, in the industry that we should be treating all our seeds with everything under the sun, including insecticides. And uh, after about two or three years after we started planting you know, we'd been having treated corn for a long time, of course, but then, you know, we just started putting the treatment on the beans, and in and, and about year two or three of that, I guess, is, is when we first started to see slugs. And, and then the next year, it got a lot worse, and we started to scratch our head and, and found uh, research done in Pennsylvania, Penn State, um, where, you know, again, so much of our ignorance of the biological, you know, we, we don't understand, we, we do something with a specific intent, not understand the unintended consequences. In this case, we thought we were protecting the soybean plant from insects later in the season and, and, and why the seedlings emerging. We didn't understand that we were killing the, the, the best predator that worked on the slugs. And so uh, we read that report and we also saw quite a bit of data that was telling us that we weren't gaining an economic advantage from this practice anyway, so we pulled the we pulled the uh, pulled the treatments and, and the slug pressure declined. Uh, and we still have slugs, but they're typically not a problem. You might get a little pocket here and there, but the problem got a lot better once we helped bring that ecological balance back into place by having the predator prey relationship. Either one of you all also have experienced those issues. I haven't tried what Dan's talking about, which probably should, because slugs are probably the Achilles heel to my entire program. Um, we'll lose all of my replant last year was due to slugs. We didn't replant that corn. We can manage them. Um, there's was a metaldehyde bullets um, that we use. Suspended potash, suspended fertilizers with salts can help, um, but it's it's costly and it's hard to scout for because if the field's green you pretty much have to walk the whole thing. Um, so our scouting has gotten really amped up, but we're saving enough money to offset the scouting. But uh, slugs seem to be our biggest biggest problem. They're the only thing we can't kill with chemicals. Mm -hmm. How about you, Jim? I don't have the, the, the slugs and the vole problems, but everyone, everybody that I talk to about that, it's the system is not right. The, the original system had all the predators that took care of in a balanced nature. And what we've done is where we took out fences, we took out animals, we took out predators. Uh, I was visiting one guy last year was having a terrible bowl uh, problem and, and Dave Brandt said, said, well, okay, do you have coyotes? No, I like to shoot the coyotes. Okay, well, uh, bobcats? Well, we love to trap bobcats. And he said, and now you're wondering why you have voles. Them's the natural predators. And so the, the ecosystem is so important. You know, we've been so focused for years and years and years in production agriculture of mono. You know, we, we want to raise corn or we want to raise wheat and we don't want anything left or right of that. And that system is not the nature system. And it's, we've thrown so we've quit all the seed treatments on our farm too. We're trying to get everything back, uh, less inputs, but it's more for the system. Mm -hmm. I'd add, you know, on, on the corollary of that on voles, uh, when we first started using a roller crimper, we'd had terrible problems with voles and we thought we'd solved it, but we really didn't. And uh, we started crimping and rolling for a different reason but one of the things we've learned in the last two years is that that's been a very effective uh, vole control. And we've also stopped shooting coyotes and we're, we're gonna work with Purdue on a project, uh, you know, barn owls, a pair of breeding owls will kill 60 to 80 voles a night. So trying to provide some uh, 
um, uh, housing for them and places to roost and, and bring back those populations. But it's all about trying to restore that natural balance so that the system is self-regulating. I was in Tennessee this, this summer uh, with Adam Doherty, some of you NRCS guys know Adam, and that they have some vole trouble in, in their county, but where they've implemented animals back in, they started noticing the voles were going away. And scientists would say, well, how could that be? Well, when you get animals back in, typically you have birds start coming back in to follow behind the animals. And so natural predators and hawks and everything started coming back in. So it, it's, it's just more backup that the system will fix itself if you allow it. I have to wonder a little bit, I'm gonna take a kind of a 90 degree turn a little bit on what I've got here in my hand, just on what you all are talking about. Because what I'm hearing is people that are really in tune to the land and really in tune to, you, you, know, you know, your low spots and your, your higher yielding spots, your lower yielding, more challenging spots. And, and I guess I'm wondering, uh, are, are you still walking your land? still really being in tune to it or and i'm just kind of wondering about the although it's very beneficial that additional challenge that new technologies of self-driving tractors and things like that you know it might uh might employ or might are, are you are you trying to make sure that you achieve that balance and still being really in tune to what's going on in your land uh, while also adopting some of these technologies anybody uh, if, I, if I'm home, uh, uh, there's hardly a day goes by that I don't walk at least five miles, and a good part of that time is across our land. So yeah. I, that's something I enjoy. And you learn things. You see something different every day. And, and uh, you know, all the technology in the world doesn't really substitute for that close contact. And, you know, and, and there's times when we get busy that I can't do it, and I have to use a motorcycle or we, drones or airplanes or whatever to to see things in real time as fast as they need to go, but, but uh, I really enjoy that, that yeah. kind of a connection. So you're, it's really important to you to maintain that connection. Uh, Absolutely. I have to think so. Trey? Um, for me, it's both. Um, I still do a lot of walking, but we also utilize technology. So I send out work orders through our software to every planner, every scout, and then I require everybody to take a picture. So we have a picture of every time anybody goes to a field and then we get like a Facebook feed with everyone's pictures. So we're kind of building intellect through the team because everyone on the team sees those same pictures. So if I have a novice out there scouting and he sees a worm, he posts it, says, these worms are here, I don't know what it is. The other scout will pop right on the same feed and said, we're seeing them here, but it's a cabbage larvae that's you know, feeding on the, the rapeseed instead of something that's detrimental. Uh -huh. So that's kind of helping educate everyone. It's kind of a neat collective um, intelligence, I call it, where everybody's kind of getting educated as they roll through the feed. And I'm required to do the same, so the fields I scout, I do the same thing. So everybody is scouting, planning, spraying. We always have a visual image with that, which has kind of helped me as we expand and get bigger and you lose the ability to walk every field every day um, to kind of use that technology to really stay in tune with things. And then at the end of the year, we've got a full photography. You know, we're hitting the fields probably twice a week at a minimum, especially where they're green. You know, we can go back and say, well, this field didn't yield good. Well, what did the cover crop look like? Because no one remembers. You know, we've just been through a full fall, fall harvest. We don't, you know, we're lucky if we knew what happened last week. Um, so the technology definitely um, helps breed the innovation. Yeah. So I'm hearing you all are always learning. You're always students. Jimmy, do you experience it that way? Yeah. Uh, when we started uh, grazing cover crops, there was a big pushback at, at headquarters from my wife and, and my one hired hand because... <laughs> If Jimmy's here talking, uh, moving cattle daily is a, a big issue. But what, is, what I really learned out of that was getting out on the land and walking and, and the serenity of listening to cattle graze. And, and, and Jim Johnston's here probably from Noble Research. He gets on to me for not being out with the cattle any, because my time's so limited. And, and traveling and doing other things. Uh, but that is the highlight of my day, is to go out and, and move a poly wire and let cattle into a new paddock or a new pasture and just listen to them grazing. And you, and you could just think back when the bison uh, was roaming the, the prairie and the big herd coming along and, and how peaceful that was. And that's, that's 
that's one of the greatest things, and it really gets you in tune to it, to what we've really missed out on and how we've really screwed the system up uh, by, by plowing and, and, and destroying what we really had. So, so I'm hearing you say, I just I was getting ready to paraphrase that, but I don't know if I could do it any better than you just did. It sounds like this, this focus and this management of what's going on in the soil is just also another avenue for, for being really in tune. Uh, to, oh yeah, to yeah. I, our regeneration of our soul has really rejuvenated our life and our process of of how we look at things. Uh, early on, we were just so focused on yield, yield, and and how we're going to get the next technology, and how how many more pounds of fertilizer can we push this in a twenty inch rainfall, and how are we going to pay the bank note? And are we going to be able to buy this place and do this? And we're just so driven in that system that we're looking over the main components. And, and, and once we got past that and really looked at a systems approach, then things started to fall back in. And, and now we're still driven. We still got to have money. We still like to buy some more land. And, and do all the things, but we're not focused on, we've got to make 100 bushel wheat. If we can make 70 bushels and be profitable, we're, we're, we're content with that. So uh, I'm not driven uh, to the point that I've got to be up at the top of production level. I, I want to be at the top, top of the profit level. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's, that's being in tune a little bit different than we've ever been. I think what, Jimmy's, uh, you know, what I would call that approach is holistic management, and it's it's uh, it's it's managing the whole instead of just focus on this piece or this piece or this piece, and recognizing that it's all related. That the water cycle and all these different factors, you know, the unintended consequences of our actions, and and, and being aware of all that and how they interplay with each other. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to take maybe just a slightly, it's all related because it's all a cycle as we are, right? We're, we're temporary stewards of the earth too. And so I guess I'm wondering, not trying to get too personal with you here right on the camera, but in, in terms of kind of, a, kind of what, what you got going on in your family in terms of handing the farm down uh, and what role that that has or has not played has not played in uh, some of your kind of your decisions to, you know, to, to focus on those systems and on, you know, replenishing and storing soil health. Has uh, is, is that been in your mind work at all or anybody? Well, one of the things that, that we face is, uh, I talked about losing my dad to cancer. And my, my oh, it's kind of a complex deal. I'll try to make this short. but. <laughs> But my dad actually didn't die from cancer. He died from radiation poisoning of missed dose. That really affected my son. And so he went into the radiation field. So that's left a little void because we only had one child. Uh, but the system always works. So I got a grandson now that is, they call him little Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> Does he have a hat? <laughs> he, he has a hat. And I'm glad you got him a hat. What a good granddad. <laughs> he, he learns if he comes to the farm, he's going to have boots, jeans, and a hat. Absolutely. And uh, uh, he's consumed, much like I was in, in my younger years, about uh, the farm. He, he loves to go dig up earthworms, and, and I'm, I'm trying to focus him in on the biology side. And so that's our, our hope for the future. But once again, we want our children to be happy. And we don't expect them to come to the farm if they don't want to come to the farm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're thinking down the road here, you know, how, how we're going to make a transition. I have a wonderful young individual, uh, Carson Libel, who works for us. Uh, he's been with us for nine years. He, uh, he just finished college uh, last year. Uh, when we helped a little bit with that, and, and we're very proud of, of Carson and what he's done. And he really understands the system now. And so it, it's, it's really 
really important that we share with our youth how agriculture can be. And, and a lot of the, the consumers and the people uh, that's away from the farm, or it's third, fourth, fifth generation now that's away, really don't understand what agriculture is and how it works and how important it is. And we sometimes get a bad rap, but we allow that bad rap because we don't answer that need. And we do a very poor job in agriculture of sharing our story. And, and I think if we share our story, that they will understand that we really care for our soil and we really care for our land. So as the next generation comes along, maybe it doesn't have to be Owen, my grandson, to take over the farm. Right. I think there's some hope in that. Good. And we've only got a couple more minutes, and I, I want to finish with a different question. But either one of you feel would like to respond to that too, in terms of kind of how your management for like managing for soil health, what role that you know kind of handing down to the next generation might play in that thought. Well, I have three sons, and uh, I should say back up that part of our competitive strategy since I started this is to use soil health as a long-term way to build a competitive advantage. That as we build our soils, that, that gives us an edge. And uh, I think the excitement over what we're doing and what we're seeing happen on the soil has is, is, is got my kids excited. And if you'd asked me 10 years ago, will they come back and forth? I'd say, well, maybe one, possibly two. But now all three of them are saying they want to do it, which creates challenges for dad. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, it's not a birthright. It's been explained that they understand there's certain things they have to do to earn the privilege, but they all seem intent on that. And the, my oldest has, in fact, uh, earned that, and he's, he's back on the farm full time now. So it's something I think about a lot, and you know, I, I, I guess I, I view my role as changing and, and you know, becoming more of a mentor and, uh, and, a, and a teacher and uh, less of a doer, perhaps. Uh, but, uh, you know, the rest of my life will be trying to... Uh, to help them uh, grab a hold of the baton and, and go forward. And, yeah. and uh, you know, the way we treat the land and the way we value the land is the ethic that is non-negotiable, <laughs> but uh, how they want to take that and, and, and move it around is up to them. Yeah, very interesting. Trey? Um, my kids are 10 and 8. My yeah. son, who's 8, has spent the last four years trying to um, become a professional soccer player. He's very <laughs> intent on it. He, yeah. he thinks he's going to manage him in Barcelona when, when he's 20. Um, which I yeah. encourage, so sure. no, they don't really have any interest in farming, but I kind of, I think my transition to getting more holistic and more ecological, whatever version we use, comes from when I had children. Um, you know, just kind of living the life, you know, if I'm telling them what I'm doing, I want to be able to explain to them what we're doing and why we're doing it. So as the kids would come out to the field, they go, well, why are you doing that? And all of a sudden be like, well, why are we plowing? Why are we doing this? Yeah. And um, I think that was probably what led to the transition. Good. We're about out of time, but I want to just kind of ask each of you, just kind of, you know, fairly briefly, if you can, just offer any advice for farmers, ranchers that are in the room that uh, that are interested in starting out uh, or continuing, you know, to learn new things. Uh, if any of you all have any thoughts on, you know, what any advice that you might have in your experience? Dan, I'll start with you. Um, a couple things, I guess. One is. Surround yourself with positive people, positive role models, positive mentors. Don't let negative people drag you down. You're going to have challenges. You need to have a positive energy around you to help push you through those challenges. And two, really, you know, with, with it's so exciting, what, you know, what I understand today versus a year ago or two years ago about biology and how our management affects it is has come light years. And so... I would have loved to have understood uh, what I do today even about soil biology when I started and I think it would have helped me succeed uh, you know, with a lot less um, bumps in the road. So really uh, think about how everything you do, intended and unintended, affects soil biology and if you can think through that process, uh, your odds of being successful are, are, are going to be really good. Excellent, excellent advice. Trey? Um, I agree with Dan. Um, I think just, to me, it made farming fun again. 
Um, I would say in my, my late 20s, early 30s, I'd become a logistics coordinator at a factory. Um, was basically what I was doing, because we were doing the same thing, we were doing it, and I really probably wasn't content. I think we've all talked about enjoying our jobs, and I don't think I was fully content because I didn't have the challenge. Um, it's it's, it, um, it's kind of hard to explain, but once I started getting into the biology and getting back into the soil, similar to, to Jimmy going out with the cattle, um, I just enjoy it a lot more, and I enjoy the challenge. Um, from a like a basics perspective, if you're doing cover crop and you want to plant greens, start with beans. Um, they're a lot more forgiving than corn. Um, the majority of the money that I've lost in mistakes, challenges, opportunities, whatever you want to call them, have all been in corn. It's a lot, it's a little funkier, but if you're a corn and bean grower, the beans are really easy. And um, we've proven many times, you know, green versus brown, we're just growing a lot better beans and higher yielding beans in the green, which makes it really kind of a fun way to get into it. You know, if you, if you screw up a whole corn field and you don't grow as much corn, it doesn't give you much energy to go do it the next year. But if you can get a couple wins in early, it makes the season go a lot better. Excellent, excellent. Jimmy? Yeah, I want to expand just a little bit on what Dan said, and they may, may or may not, but all the partners that helped me, I know some of them are here. Willie's in the background, NRCS. Jim, where are you at? Right over with Jim Johnson, Noble Research. Surround yourself with people and partners that, that can help you. The, the, the internet is your friend nowadays. Uh, wh when I'm in the field, if I'm spraying, I'm either listening to a podcast or a YouTube video or making a YouTube video to share. Uh, that's the important thing. And if you're just starting out, uh, that's the key. And, and you don't have to do it by yourself. And there's no cookie cutter scenario that any three of us up here can tell you. And I can't tell you what cover crop's gonna work on your place because it may be a 20 or 40 or 50 or a different rainfall or different uh, heating days, on and on and on and on. But the internet is a good partner, but there's nothing that beats boots on the ground that, that will help you identify and the Jimmy rule is three years the the and, and the first year is going to be crappy is the word I use and why is it crappy because that below my hat and in between my ears is not ready to learn how to look at, at the importance of the system the second year is going to be better the third year that's when the system's gonna to start to turn a little bit. And then the fourth and fifth year, you're, you're, if you can get over the third year, you're never going back. And, and just remember that. That doesn't mean that there's not challenges in year four, five, six, or seven, or 15. There's always challenges. But you have to stay the course. And, and, and when you see a problem or issue, surround yourself with somebody that can help you through that. And don't go to the coffee shop <laughs> because they're gonna say, I told you it wouldn't work and you, you can't make that work here. Don't do that. Surround yourself with positive people that will say, we can help you make that work. Great, well this has been really exciting. Will you all please join me in thanking the family? So is it okay if I offer up? I had a, a few questions we didn't get to, but if the folks that wrote those or didn't get to your questions, uh, please feel free to uh, corner them. Uh, you all be around the rest of the conference today and tomorrow. Yeah, I'm not seeing no, so yeah. Um, now I have the uh, pleasure, before we uh, move into something else, uh, for uh, uh, introducing uh, Sally Rocky, Dr. Sally Rocky. She's the... Uh, Executive Director of the Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research. Uh, she's been in that position since September of 2015, so it's a relatively uh, young organization. Uh, before that, she was a leader in federal research, overseeing operations and extramural programs in both agriculture and biomedicine. She worked for USDA for 19 years, and then for the National Institutes of Health. She was a Deputy Director for Extramural Research, 
uh, leading groundbreaking initiatives and activities that will really have a long-lasting impact on the research community. And she has her PhD in entomology from Ohio State University. And uh, that's insects, uh, bugs. And uh, she was recently named a fellow of the Entomological Society of America. So would you please help me welcome Dr. Sally Rocky. Well, thank you um, very much for that introduction, Dr. Honeycutt. And uh, I also want to thank the um, Howard G. Buffett Foundation and the Soil and Water Conservation Society for sponsoring this event and having you all here. So I'm pleased to be with you this morning to make a special announcement of a significant milestone for uh, farmers, producers, conservationists, and anyone else who cares about soil health. So I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Honeycutt back to the stage, along with Mr. Larry Clemens from the Nature Conservancy, uh, Nick Gazer from the Soil Health Partnership. I'd also like to invite Lakeisha Odom, who is our Scientific Program Director from FAR. And last, as a surprise, I'd love to have Rob Myers join us on the stage. So we all know that uh, soil health is such a critical component of productivity and, and a sustainable uh, agricultural system. In fact, farming practices that improve soil health can increase profitability while protecting our vital natural sources like air and water and for all of our communities. And but you, what you all know is that we don't have a um, universally adopted way of measuring soil health in the United States and ultimately a lack of this standard um, has worked against us in many ways. My foundation, the Foundation for Food and Agricultural Research, looks at ways to, re uh, to bridge research gaps and to put funding behind innovative research uh, and help organize scientists, producers, and stakeholders to address challenges in the food and agricultural sciences. So in a, just a few years of our existence, we began about two years ago, FAR has awarded over 40 grants uh, to very innovative projects and worked with funding partners to invest more than $170 million on uh, cutting edge science with more than 70 partners. And the project we're announcing today is a great example of our model. Our model really is to bring partnership together around these critical issues where we bring um, funding from the private sector along with funding uh, uh, from the public sector, which FAR is part, along with philanthropists and producers and others to spur this game change research. So today I am proud to announce the second largest grant we've ever given at FAR, but more importantly one of the largest single investments in soil health um, to be awarded with FAR, the Soil Health Institute, the Soil Health Partnership, and with the Nature Conservancy. And uh, let me go down one slide. So this is a, a, pr a project that will, s will be spurring innovation in soil health and accelerating the adoption of soil health management across the United States and across the globe. Uh, FAR will be investing $9.4 million in this project. We also um, have a match of a number of, of really wonderful partners uh, that will be um, th from General Mills, Jeremy and Hannah-Laura Grantham um, Trust, Midwest Row Cro uh, Crop Collaborative, Monsanto, Nestle, Perina Pet Care Company, the Samuel Roberts Noble Foundation, Walmart Foundation, and the Walton Family Foundation. All together, we and other individual donors who we will together put uh, around $20 million on this project. And this is really a game-changing uh, for soil health in the United States, we will improve soil health and ultimately support uh, the, the positive economic and, and environmental outcomes for American farmers. The project's collaborative research and education will accelerate adoption and benefits of soil health management systems nationally by offering a standardized measurement to evaluate and improve soil health by engaging farmers with on-farm research that's going to take our basic science and um, put it into practice um, with, with on-farm research and to also work with non-operator uh, uh, landowners to embrace soil health principles. On behalf of FAR, 
and our board of directors, our project funders. I congratulate the Soil Health Institute, the Soil Health Partnership, and the uh, Nature Conservancy on this amazing opportunity. I also want to thank Lakeisha Odom for bringing this over the, the, uh, the finish line, and also Rob Myers, who has been with us from the very start two years ago working on this project. Um, Please share the news around this announcement. I'm so excited about the project and what is going to be the outcome. Uh, we have a Twitter tag for this conference that you can share, of course. Tag us at atfoundation.far. And uh, we would love to um, engage all of you. There's many ways that you can get involved in this project. So you can meet with, uh, with anyone on this stage to learn more about it. And also please visit with me or my staff or others and, um, about not only this project, but about our organization. So I want to congratulate again all of our wonderful partners and congratulate to you who, who your foundation, our foundation, um, is trying to work to make uh, agriculture, advance agriculture in every way possible. So thanks again.